There's always something fascinating about exploring, you know, those hidden bits of knowledge, whether it's old traditions or just the complexity of nature itself. Absolutely. It's like finding these threads that connect uh, ancient history with the natural world around us. Every little detail matters. Exactly. And today we're diving into source material you shared with us. It focuses on one specific subject, a mushroom strain called the Inca Stargazer. It really is a captivating name. So our goal here is to untack what the source material tells us, specifically about the mycology, the characteristics of this particular psilocybe cubensis. We'll stick close to the text. Okay, let's jump in. The source starts with its origin, South America. It says it grows in these pretty dense clusters along the Andes Mountains. Right, and that origin really connects to the name Stargazer. The source points out that growing way up there at high elevations in the Andes, well, it makes the name feel quite fitting, doesn't it? Closer to the stars. It really does paint a picture. The article also touches briefly on its history, mentioning use by the ancient Inca tribe. Yeah, this is where you see that potential deep connection. The source mentions finding golden mushroom pendants near Machu Picchu. They're dated back to around 1200 AD, which is, well, a pretty solid clue about its role in spiritual rituals. Golden pendants, 1200 AD. That's quite evocative. Suggests it held real significance. It seems so. And sticking just to the source details, it mentions it being part of the indigenous diet alongside coca leaves, apparently used for energy, for endurance at those high altitudes. Kind of a practical aspect. Interesting. Okay, moving from history to biology, the source describes its appearance. Pretty classic look. Golden cap, bright white stem. But it highlights one feature that really stands out. Yeah, yes. This is where the mycology gets specific. It talks about pre-existing blue staining or bruising. So this isn't just from handling it. You can apparently see it when the mushrooms cut open. Pre-existing bruising. Exactly. And the article notes this bluing is often linked to higher potency. It also makes a broader point that golden cap varieties, generally speaking, tend to have higher alkaloid content than some other types. That's a key detail. And the source digs deeper into the spores and genetics too, right? It does. It mentions the stem tends to be longer and uh, skinnier. But the really striking thing is the spore load. Once that veil opens, it releases a heavy amount of jet black spores. Jet black, heavy load. And the source connects that to something specific. Yes, it calls this out as a sign of aggressive genetics, basically indicating a really vigorous and effective reproductive strategy built to spread efficiently. Okay, aggressive in the sense of being robust and successful at reproducing. And there was something unique about its spore printing too. That's a major point the source emphasizes about wild strains like this one. It says you can take a spore print from the stargazer not just once, but maybe two or even three times and still get a good dark print loaded with spores. Three times, why is it, that so notable? Well, the source draws a direct contrast with a lot of the newer lab-created strains or genetic mutations. It says many of those barely drop spores or sometimes don't drop them at all. So this ability of a wild strain like the stargazer is becoming uh, increasingly rare in cultivated lines. That's quite a contrast. It really highlights how traits essential for survival in the wild, like massive spore production, might get lost or aren't prioritized when humans start cultivating or selecting for other things in a lab setting. Precisely. It shows how selection pressures change things. But despite these wild traits, the source also mentions the stargazer is actually considered suitable for beginner mycologists to work with. And it's fast, too. The source mentioned a quick growth cycle. Yeah. Apparently, it can be finished in just two to three weeks. The article emphasizes that these landrace individuals, these naturally evolved regional varieties, often combine that heavy potency with fast growth cycles. It links those traits to their wild origins. The source even provides specific growing conditions for anyone interested in the practical mycology. It does. Suggests a temperature sweet spot between 76 and 82 degrees Fahrenheit. And it warns that going higher really bumps up the contamination risk, which is always something to watch in mycology. Makes sense. Yeah. What about airflow, fresh air exchange? Specifies zero FAE during colonization, keeping humidity at 100%. But then for fruiting, it recommends shifting to two to five air exchanges per hour and dropping humidity just a bit to around 80%. Quite detailed parameters. Okay, so let's pull these mycological threads together from the source. We have the aggressive genetics, the heavy black spore load, that repeatable spore printing, the fast growth, the blue bruising. What picture does this paint? It paints a picture of an organism really well adapted for thriving in its original environment. The genetics, the spores, that's all about successful reproduction. The fast growth helps it compete, 
the bruising will relate to its chemistry. And that emphasis on spore dropping compared to modern strains really underscores its wild robustness. It certainly draws a clear line between wild adaptation and human cultivation goals. The article also slips in a little bit of mycological lore, right? Yeah, it mentions a rumor that Stamets noted its vigorous growth in one of his books. The, the source is careful to frame it as, you know, anecdotal, the strain wasn't named explicitly, but the reputation for fast, strong growth was apparently known, leading to this rumor, part of its modern story. So bringing this back to you, our listener, why focus so much on the mycological details of just one strain? What's the significance here? Well, understanding these specific traits gives us real insights into fungal biology. It's like a case study in natural selection. You see which characteristics like heavy spore production or fast growth give an organism an edge in a challenging place like the high Andes. It's evolution in action. And how does knowing these specifics like the spore printing ability or the growth speed actually inform how mycologists might approach different strains? It directly impacts their work. If you know a strain is a reliable, heavy sporulator, it's great for generating cultures or studying dispersal. If it grows aggressively, maybe it's useful for looking at how fungi colonize substrates quickly. These traits aren't just trivia, they guide research and cultivation choices. And thinking about the history and the biology together, its unique traits and that potential Inca connection, mm -hmm. what does that tell us more broadly? It suggests a really functional relationship developed over time. An organism doesn't become important culturally, whether for diet or ritual, unless its specific traits made it relevant to the people in that environment. Its ability to grow there, its potential effects, maybe even its perceived hardiness, these characteristics likely made it significant to the Inca. It speaks to that long interplay between life forms and their surroundings, including humans. So this deep dive really spotlights the Inca stargazer as a fascinating wild psilocybe cubensis. Coming from the Andes, with those historical hints, but really distinguished by its mycology, the blue bruising, the aggressive genetics, and especially that impressive spore production that stands out against modern strains. Exactly. It's a great example of the unique strengths you can find in these natural land race varieties shaped by their home environment. Which leaves us with a final thought for you. As we study these wild landrace strains, like the stargazer with its robust spore production and vigorous growth, what deeper lessons about biological resilience and adaptation might we be missing if we only focus on traits prioritized in labs or cultivation? What more can we learn from the characteristics that let these organisms thrive in the wild?